Welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our guests from San Francisco, Director of Artificial Intelligence and Global Partnerships for Microsoft Philanthropies, uh, Scott Mauvais. Uh, welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. <laughs> I'm so glad that we can talk because uh, like uh, human approach to technology, it's one of the biggest topics we try to cover during the festival and on our, uh, on our media. And I think uh, a lot of your experience from what I've read and seen you uh, online is exactly about this. So how we, how, we can tr how we can translate the technologies, especially those which are very often difficult to understand, like artificial intelligence uh, on a practical level, how they can be used for good. And I think I have a few questions that uh, I want to like extract some examples from you. But before we jump into those bigger questions, uh, is there like one specific technology that you feel that changed your life for a better, like something from a personal mm. space, from a personal yeah. level? Well, I've been a tech geek for a long time, so it's hard to pick just one, but I, I think probably MP3 players and the MP3 format, I think I would have to pick on that. You know, one, not only does it give us access to music on the go, uh, but it, it also is forms the basis of podcasts, a lot of um, books online have moved that way. So it's a great way of consuming content when you're on the go or for people that um, uh, have uh, disabilities that can't read. It's, an, it's a different way of consuming information. So I think that's probably been the most ubiquitous one that I personally have benefited from. Uh, thinking about future past and, and memories, you've been with the company for, uh, for some time. And I think that even your previous experience with technology, even something between Microsoft, you probably have a lot of thoughts about what are the trends that are shifting us um, in the last 20, 30 years. And I'm looking for those kinds of trends in technologies that are the most persistent, that are like changing even, we, even without the hype. So something that's like been there for maybe 20, 30 years, it's not something just like from last two weeks or a few months, like NFTs, uh, that are, that, 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 that are come some kind of power of good, but for, for, a, for a longer period of time already. So I, I don't know if it's, it's uh, something that's been around for a long time, but I, I think a, a, a sort of a, a, a persistent trend of change is computing becoming more ubiquitous and um, there are more and more sensors everywhere. So, you know, it's not like you go and use your PC anymore in the den or in the workplace. Um, it's, 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 it surrounds us. It's in, it's in our phones. It's in our watches. It's in sensors in buildings. It's sensors in sidewalks. And so we, this sort of, this sort of, ubiquitous technology layer, I think, is sort of the persistent change that we've had. And the sensors, I think, are uh, another important piece because it, they're, they're no longer limited to sort of the ethereal world of cyberspace. They're, um, where, you know, they're now where they can go and in, sense and interact with the real world. They're collecting data 24-7, which gives us a better understanding of our physical world. You know, they're collecting data constantly and also data at a granularity that we humans don't necessarily perceive. And so this gives us really a macro view of everything from satellite imagery down to micro, image, micro data, um, such as blood glucose monitors. And you know, we're, we're able to take that data and then harness that to better improve uh, our understanding of the physical systems, um, help protect biodiversity, help protect water, uh, we talked about sort of MP3 players, so we have sort of cross-sense input. You know, we can take a scene and read it off to a person and give them an understanding of what the environment is when they're walking by a store, or give them an audio signal when they're coming up to their bus stop. Um, think, of the, think of the complexity that we have in, in being able to find real-time location of where you are right now, not only where you are, but the context of the environment around you, what the stores are, what their open, what, you know, what their menus are, what their hours are. Um, and then layer on top of that directions between point A and point B. And then on top of that, we have algorithms that do this wonderful matching of uh, a driver to you so that food or a car will show up at your doorstep in minutes. That's an amazing level of complexity that has opened up the doors to new work opportunities. You know, you don't need to know your way around a city to be a driver. I've had a number of deaf Uber drivers. You know, these are, you know, we can argue about whether those are good jobs or not. That's a separate conversation, happy to have it. But those are, those are new um, income opportunities that provided people who would otherwise be excluded from the labor market. If we can switch from the meta perspective of trying to solve collaborative problems 
uh, but with the still inclusion in mind. Like one of the things I, I know from Microsoft work, and as we mentioned at the beginning, like even MP3 players is something that could bring uh, accessibility to people. Uh, one of the things I, I follow from Microsoft work is uh, inclusive design. And I think this is one of the, uh, like the terms I, I hear the most from, especially uh, people from UX in Poland. Uh, and uh, what I often, often don't understand or people ask me about is like, okay, so, but how do you approach inclusive design especially when you also need to sell a lot of products. So like if it's possible to, to do inclusive design uh, for such fast changing technologies for, for consumer technologies. So that's a great question. And um, to take a step back a little bit, you know, yeah, inclusive design is something that's it's core to the company. And you know, it really is rooted in our mission statement, which is to empower um, every person to achieve more. Um, and so every person, so if you're designing for the quote average user, you're going to exclude people. Um, and what, you know, what we've learned uh, uh, is that it's very difficult to bolt on inclusivity after the fact. It's similar to what we learned in the late 90s um, and early 2000s around security. If you don't design your products with security in mind from the beginning, it's very hard to secure them afterwards. And the same way, if you don't design them to be inclusive, it's very hard to make them inclusive. And so our, our design methodology is, is rooted in the premise that creators, um, they tend to um, have inherent biases of how through their lived experience, how they think a tool should be used, how someone would interact with it. And that gets then reflected in the products and services they build. And so if you want to build inclusive services, you have to co-design with people, the, the end users of that product. So if you're co-designing for people with mobility challenges, they should be en engaged in the designing of the packaging of your product or the interface. Uh, same with visual impairments, same with cognitive um, uh, neurodiversity. Those are things that if you don't involve people in the, in the design, uh, you, you will end up with, with exclusionary products. So why this matters to Microsoft is, you know, we are a tools company, we make collaboration tools. Collaboration tools benefit from a traditional network effect. The more users there are, the more valuable that product is. So if you have a number of your employees who are unable to use um, a, a word processing tool um, or a presentation tool because um, of the, because the, they can't read a document. Uh, it doesn't have uh, the text. Doesn't have alternate. Alt the photos don't have alternate text. Then that that product has less value because the the team is able to collaborate less efficiently. So we're very focused on how do we make sure that people with disabilities can both create and consume content uh, with all their coworkers, and also make it easy for coworkers without disabilities to make sure that the content they create is is easily consumed. So that's everything from auto captioning the photos in PowerPoint, accessibility checkers to flag things like low contrast ratio in, in colors, um, reading level um, uh, for people that may, um, that may have some cognitive disabilities, um, the learning tools, different fonts you can use uh, for people with dyslexia. Um, and so those are things that, that why it matters to us. You mentioned, you asked about how you could sort of do it um, at scale in a, in a fast changing um, in a fast changing um, uh, marketplace. Well, we're, you know, we're a platform vendor. So we're really focused on how do we build these tools into our core platform so that people that build upon them essentially get them for free. So you don't have to go, uh, if you're an independent software vendor, go build a bunch of accessibility tools. You can just live, um, leverage the APIs and the framework that Microsoft provides. You know, a, a great example of that is the iGaze product that started off as really a hackathon inside of Microsoft for how you could essentially uh, uh, use a webcam to track your eye movement, which would then change into input using, say, a soft keyboard. I could look at various letters, I could look at various phrases, and the um, the software would detect where I'm I'm, look, I'm gazing and would then go uh, provide that input. Well, so that's now built into Windows 11, so that any software vendor that is creating a product could easily enable their their product to be usable by eye gaze for people um, that have mobility challenges. Thank you a lot for those examples because I think the the accessibility is very often overlooked part of the technology. That is not that we are trying to make the technology accessible. It's also that technology makes a lot of things accessible for people 
who were not being able to do a lot of stuff before, or it was much more difficult. And uh, one more question to, to finish, uh, because uh, I still want to ask you about something that's kind of like the main topic and the main title of this edition of our conference. Uh, and we thought about trust a lot and we kind of moved from digital trust to something that's like a bigger issue of trust in, in current, uh, current uh, world. And uh, I wanted to finish with a question how, how we can help ourselves to uh, trust that we can solve current or future problems with if, within technology. So I think like this is a question from a perspective of people who think or learn how to code, how to design. A, they, they want to provide uh, not only, they want to provide some value to the future. They don't want to just work for the technolo technological companies. They want to feel that they, they can trust themselves, that they can solve something. So how we can build this kind of trust and skill in ourselves? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you know, the, the technology industry is really underpinned by trust. And if we lose people's trust, it is going to not only damage our industry, the prospects of our industry, but also really, um, uh, I'm a tech optimist. So that if, we, if, we're, if we're able to solve a lot of problems with technology, if people don't trust it, those problems are going to remain unsolved. So, you know, a bit of my, my personal experience is, you know, I have an econ background. Um, I went to school in the, in the late 80s. And, you know, a lot of my colleagues went off into investment banking. Um, and, you know, you know, essentially what they did in their careers was they created more exotic financial products or they built high uh, frequency trading algorithms that looked at public market data and essentially they front run ran um, other traders strategies. Um, I, I get the value and the importance of liquidity in our financial markets, but is that really where we should be dedicating the best and brightest minds of a generation to go solve? You know, weren't there bigger problems to go solve? Um, and we're seeing the same thing now where the, great, the best AI students are um, working for companies that are, you know, building algorithms to make sure um, a user clicks my links, my blue links, not your blue links, uh, that they scroll through yet one more screen of, of social media uh, and stay engaged. Um, and, you know, I love my social media. Um, I love um, my ability to have information regularly available um, uh, through search engines. But is that really the, the best thing we could be doing? And so that's a lot of the premise behind um, AI for Good, is how do we create um, examples of using technology, AI, machine learning, uh, to solve global problems, health, um, income, uh, sustainability, um, humanitarian response. Um, and also, how do we um, provide avenues for people that want to go ha to have a more social, impactful career to go work on these problems? And you know, part of it is a, is a scale issue. If you, if you, if we're, once again, it's a platform company. If we're able to build um, a, a, a set of APIs, a set of data sets that gets people started down the path of um, of working on these issues, we can greatly expand the number of people that can work on them because you don't have to be an expert data scientist, an expert mathematician to make any progress. You can be a Python coder. You can have a little data understanding and be able to, to build upon this framework um, that we've built. Um, in the AI for Health um, initiative that we have, one thing that we particularly looked at is where, you know, where the AI researchers sat. What industries were they in? And they're, they're, they're broadly in technology and in finance. They're, healthcare has gobs and gobs of data, has huge needs around um, how we could better um, combat diseases, how we could make sure that we, we had a better understanding of different gender, different race, different ethnic background, income, location. Because a lot of drugs aren't tested broadly. You know, could we use technology to, to make, provide better equitable access to, to treatments? And so the AI for Health program is very specifically around how do we, we provide data scientists uh, to organizations that are working on healthcare to help them um, uh, better understand how they could use artificial intelligence and machine learning to solve their problems because there aren't that many people in that discipline in those industries. Scott, thank you. Like you gave me some hope and I think you gave a lot, a lot of hope to people who are, who are thinking, watching us right now. It was a pleasure to, uh, talking to you and I hope you, uh, you will maybe join us in the future on <laughs> next editions of uh, Sector 3.0.